At the beginning of the 20th century, there were some enduring mysteries of the subatomic world that physicists were beginning to have to confront and have to answer. So as soon as we start revealing the existence of atoms and subatoms and tiny little particles and start inquiring into their relationship with a light, we start to open the door to quantum mechanics. And at first, it's very confusing. Uh, we have light that is somehow acting as both a wave and a particle. We have the existence of atoms, which up until that point had been debated for like a century. And we have spectroscopy, and I can't understate the role that spectroscopy has in the development of quantum mechanics. We discover that there are different kinds of elements, and that these elements uh, give off their own fingerprints of light. Very specific wavelengths of light can be emitted by different elements, and we had no clue what was going on. This had been known for decades by this point, by the early 1900s, and yet no one knew what caused spectroscopy. Why do certain atoms give off certain wavelengths of light? And so the first attempts to develop a picture of the subatomic world go under the heading of old quantum theory, and this is generally the quantum theory developed prior to World War I, and it starts with Max Planck. Max Planck was studying a specific kind of radiation called black body radiation, which is one of the worst names ever in physics. It makes no sense whatsoever. Basically, it's a device for looking at the kind of light uh, that's emitted by hot things. So you have a chamber and you put something hot in there and then you have a little opening that you look through and you can study the kind of light that comes out of it. Our problem with black body radiation is that we had no idea how that light coming off that hot object could have the spectrum that it did, where there's a little bit of short wavelengths, a lot of mid wavelengths, and then a, a little bit of long wavelengths. Like why did it have that specific shape to the spectrum of light coming off these objects. Our classical theories of how light behaved and how matter emitted light simply couldn't figure it out. Max Planck in 1901 proposed a, a hack, basically. He said maybe light is emitted in chunks. Maybe there is a certain minimum amount of light that matter can emit. In other words, maybe light is quantized. This little fix introduced into the equations completely described black body radiation. Max Planck himself though didn't believe it. He thought it was just some ugly hack in the math that worked and that later we'll figure out what's actually going on and why this uh, quantization of the emission of light appears to be a thing, but that's so weird and so ugly he ended up winning the Nobel Prize for it. And um, it turns out that the emission of light is quantized, but it took us a while to believe it. Uh, the second step in the development of the old quantum theory, this is the, the first introduction of developing ideas and theories of, of the subatomic world came from Albert Einstein in 1905. And part of the year when he was busy revolutionizing other areas of physics, he looked at something called the photoelectric effect, where if you take um, a metal bar essentially and shine a light on it, the light hits the metal bar and then electrons pop off of the metal bar. They receive a bunch of energy from the light and then they go flying, all right? Not a big deal, except if your wavelength of light, if your frequency of light is too low, no matter how much you light you shine on that bar, electrons will never come off. So think about that. If you change the color of the light that you are shining on this metal bar, you can either get a lot of electrons or you get no electrons at all. And that doesn't make sense in classical thinking because it shouldn't matter the wavelength of the light, the frequency of the light. As long as you get enough energy into that metal bar, the electrons should come popping off. What Einstein proposed was that Light wasn't just emitted in quantized chunks, but light was made of quantized chunks.
And this was able to explain the photoelectric effect because if you shine a light with the wrong frequency, those photons, which it took a couple years for uh, this, these quantized chunks of light to get that name, but if you shine these photons on the metal bar, it takes a certain amount of minimum energy to get the electrons to pop off of the metal bar. And if they don't get that energy, then they'll never fly off. Now in classical thinking, you can just keep adding on the energy and the electrons start getting jigglier and jigglier and then finally they get so irritated they fly off the bar. But in quantum thinking, if you don't have the right frequency of light, if the energy of the individual photons isn't enough, you will never get the electrons to jump off the metal. They'll never, they don't add up energy. They don't sit there soaking up energy and then go flying off. The photon hits them, deposits his energy, and the electron jumps a little. And if it's not enough energy, it just settles back down and that's it. Einstein introduced the idea of light itself being quantized, which was an evolution of Max Planck's thinking, which was that the emission of light is quantized, like somehow where how matter interacts with itself and creates light, that is a quantized process. Einstein said light itself is quantized. By the way, almost nobody believed him, uh, but you know, eventually they did. And the last step in the old quantum theory was the development of Niel Bohr. And the last step in the development of the old quantum theory was Niels Bohr's model of the atom. So this is that stereotypical picture of the atom where you have a little nucleus in the center and then the electrons go in these little orbits around the nucleus. We now know this picture is wrong, but at the time it was a revolutionary idea. Not because it put the electrons in little orbits around the nucleus. That wasn't the big idea. The big idea was that these orbits are quantized. That an electron can't have any orbit it wants around the nucleus. Uh, you, we've, if you think of planets orbiting the sun, a planet could in principle be anywhere. Earth is at this distance from the sun, but we could be a little bit closer. We could be a little bit further. It, you know, it doesn't really matter. It was just chance how we ended up at this precise orbit. But that's not the case for electrons in an atom. They can't have any orbit they want. They can have this orbit, they can have that orbit, they can have this one over here, that there is quantized energy levels, there's quantized orbits in the atom. Now with this model, Bohr was able to explain the spectrum of hydrogen emission, that if you heat up some hydrogen and it glows and it gives its precise uh, fingerprint pattern of light that it emits, the Bohr model is able to explain it. Has a lot of difficulty with other elements, but it was a first step. And so we see with these three results, the introduction of the idea of quantization when it comes to subatomic physics. That subatomic physics, you don't get any answer you want. There's nothing continuous about it. Not just light, which is quantized, not just electrons, which are also quantized in their energy levels, but also the interaction between light and matter is also quantized. You put all these results together and it tells you that the subatomic world plays by a different set of rules and those rules are grounded in quantization, which is certain things like light or energy levels in an, in an atom can only have certain discrete values. They can't have any value they want. This progress in quantum mechanics was paused because of the buildup to World War I, but after World War I, physicists would return to these same questions and develop the full quantum theory. But that's the next episode. Thank you so much for watching. Please go to patreon.com slash pmsutter and like, share, and subscribe to all the usual YouTube stuff, and I'll see you next time.